Yukon. Huskies. Huskies. Yukon. All right. It's been a while. It's been a while. Okay, all right. Well, I'm glad everybody's here. I'm glad you finally woke up and joined me in a Yukon chant. Uh, welcome to Elevate Your Career Next Level. My name is Josh Prim, the Director of Alumni Engagement for the Yukon Office of Alumni Relations. We're thrilled to have you guys here for year two of this program. We're about to get started, but being at iHeart, we've got to show you a little bit of what iHeart's all about before we get started. So we have a little sizzle video that we're going to kick off right now for you guys to get started, and we'll be right back. TVs, your radios, your computers, and buckle up your seats. We're gonna have a good time. In the middle of the night, Everyone in music wants to be here tonight. You should say the things we do. Dream, work hard, and maybe someday somebody will be giving you an award, calling you an innovator. I'm Elvis Duran from Elvis Duran in the Morning Show. <laughs> oh, makes me feel like I'm on the radio. Happy birthday, dear Romeo. That's what radio is all about, the feeling and emotion. In the middle of the night. I Heart Radio, they've come up with so many amazing ideas. Kick them all, how you feel? Secrets. Write down your answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be on Jeopardy. Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd take home a big pile of cash. I, I won. You should see the things we do. I don't do anything that I'm not passionate about. Acknowledge, you know, where you've been and have an eye towards where you're going. It's the iHeartRadio Music Awards red carpet. Let's go. I'm just happy to be a part of it. I'm happy to be here with y'all. Truly got love for everybody in here, man. Thank you. In the middle of the night, my dreams, my dreams. No one gets you closer to the artists you love than iHeartRadio. This iHeartRadio Live is streaming in Times Square. Night, We're going to Blake Shelton's ranch right now. All right. So now we all know what iHeartMedia is all about, right? I don't know about you guys, but it seems pretty fun to work here. We've got some great insight for you all on what happens, the inner workings here at iHeartMedia. Uh, I just learned a quick tidbit. Uh, we are here, and Duke is not. And Duke has never been here, but they will be here next week, but we're here first, so just remember that. Uh, I believe that's how it works out in basketball games as well, usually, right? All right. Uh, we are recording this, so hopefully one of them sees this. Uh, anyways, we've got a great panel for you tonight, uh, but before we get started, we've got a couple people I want to recognize. If you've met somebody today that has a blue star on their name tag, those folks are part of our local New York City Alumni Network Committee. They help to put on these activities. Uh, my, I, I am based up in stores. Our team is based up in stores. We do have some folks that work here uh, in the New York City market, but we can't do that in every single city across the country. So we rely heavily on these folks. So we've got a few over here on our right, a few scattered here. You met some on the way in the door today at the front entrance here. Uh, if I can ask you for a round of applause, they do so much for UConn. If you see somebody with a red star, that means that they used to be in that position and help out uh, in a variety of ways. We've got some folks sitting in the audience. Uh, one of our panelists here is a former member and a current member at the same time, depending on what he's involved with. Uh, but we have a number of folks that uh, give their time uh, to really promote the efforts that UConn and what UConn has meant to them over the years. The next person I'm going to introduce to you today is actually going to introduce our moderator and get our panel started but uh, has been an integral part of the alumni community for a number of years now. A past president of the Hartford chapter, past president of our alumni association before we integrated into the Yukon Foundation. 
Uh, and this gentleman, you may have seen his family name attached to many of our opportunities tied to the Elevate Your, Your Career Next Level initiative, is Dennis Kavanaugh. Ka Dennis Kavanaugh is the in uh, initiator of our Kavanaugh Family Alumni Career Services Fund, which goes to help promote and pr uh, provide support for these events that you see here in New York and across the country. And he's got a few words for you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, first of all, I have neither a red star or a blue star. Uh, <laughs> In fact, handwritten <laughs> name. Uh, but uh, look, at on behalf of my family and the uh, Alumni Career Services Fund, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight uh, to a very exclusive event, one designed, uh, I think, to enhance all of our professional uh, lives and, and careers, uh, which is what it's about. And I wanted to just take a few minutes before introducing tonight's uh, panel moderator to tell you a little bit about the mission and fund uh, mission and uh, purpose of the fund and how programs like Elevate uh, are in line with and serve that purpose of the fund. Um, as Josh mentioned, I've been around the alumni, uh, UConn alumni for some time now, um, as my appearance may suggest, and um, I have over those years served in a lot of capacities and met a lot of alum and been around a lot of higher education uh, folk who have given a lot of thought to what distinguishes a higher, one higher education institution from another and what, um, and, and even between institutions, uh, what really sets one apart from the other. And aside from obviously a quality education, I don't think there's any doubt UConn has been providing that for a very, very long time. Um, but higher education institutions, when students consider going to those institutions, when students reflect on what those educations and value that education has brought, um, have, and we did a survey, I think, about 10 years ago on this, um, have, have looked at other aspects of it. And, and one of the things is they want value post-graduation. And how do they define value? Um, we found that they define value by the kinds of uh, things that the university can offer up after graduation, and, uh, and, and one of the ways we can do that is through uh, their alumni base and um, through career planning, services, development, education, all of what uh, Elevate is here to promote and has been promoting and hopefully in the future will be allowed to promote. So um, it's, this is a bit of a shameless pitch that um, uh, I have two recommendations for everybody in this room, and, 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 and one is that uh, to pitch to all of you to become really, really active uh, as UConn alum. Uh, it, it, it's important to uh, obviously have a strong alumni uh, base. Uh, the university really benefits from that. Um, and secondly, uh, if you're um, enduring your uh, um, philanthropic, uh, through your philanthropic giving, uh, whether it's annual or otherwise, that you consider to um, um, uh, have your donations and as you um, consider making a donation to the university, direct it to um, the Alumni Association, direct it, whether it's to uh, the fund that we're, our family sponsors or um, another fund through the Alumni Association, but funds that allow events like this to be pulled together uh, and uh, to be held because a stronger alumni base means a stronger university. So with that, I'm going to introduce the moderator for tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. And because this moderator has quite a distinguished career, I'm going to have to read, which is not something I like to do. Uh, but I'd like to introduce John Brady. And he is, uh, and I have to, I found out a little bit more about this, but he's been defined as an honorary Husky by now. And uh, Josh can elaborate on that. Uh, but um, he's an executive coach and keynote speaker, frequent media, uh, on, um, frequent media source matters related to corporate and career performance. Uh, Mr. Brady's current and recent clients span the U.S. and the U.K., including senior managers and executives at Goldman Sachs, GE, uh, Hewitt Packard, Apple, Shell, Hess, Southwest Airlines, and the list goes on and on, uh, including the federal government of the United States. Uh, currently, John is the founder and executive director of ProTem Partners, an international executive and career coaching firm that has partnered with UConn alumni for over three years now, and as I understand, has been a big, big asset in terms of uh, web pages and that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to turn it over to John.
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. It almost sounds like I'm somebody important when you say it all that way. Um, good evening. Uh, Happy New Year. Welcome to Midtown Manhattan, to New York, to the iHeart uh, offices here in New York. Uh, hopefully, you've been able to enjoy your evening and enjoy everyone's company, but we're going to dive right into things here. Before we get into the heavy content, uh, what often happens is a lot of the thank yous often come at the end as an afterthought. And events like this, uh, the talking heads up here get all the visibility, but uh, all of the AV and event management uh, gets done by folks who try to make it all appear as seamless as possible. And uh, I know they're in the back room, but Chris, Chris, and Allie, thank you so much for all you're doing to make sure that uh, we can be heard and look all pretty in the, in the lights and get the got the video going, it was sort of a last minute thing we added uh, to share with all of you, but thank you. So uh, first to uh, introduce our primary panelists uh, to my immediate right, most of you probably know John Peterson. Uh, John, I've learned, started out his career on Wall Street. You were PwC first and then went to Goldman after that, as I understand it, and rather than go through the their entire bio, you can look at them when you go back to the event registration page. But uh, after navigating the financial services world for a while, found your way uh, to Warner, I believe, if I'm getting my timeline right. And now you hold the title of uh, SVP and CFO here at iHeart. And I know you just came in from San Antonio this morning, so John's had a long day. But uh, John's responsible for a lot of things here at iHeart. We're going to talk more about that in a couple of moments. And so is our other guest, uh, Kamal Kamal Patel, who is, I believe, not a UConn graduate, but a Pace grad, Pace. graduate of Pace. And we found out in warm up in the green room time that we were all about the same age. We went to school around the same time. So um, that we've, uh, we got to compare notes and talk about how quickly the time goes by. But you started out with the NHL, I think, right? I that was where your career kicked off. And it was, it, was that accounting? Yeah, you start out in accounting um, at the NHL. Uh, also, uh, Kamal, as John has moved into a number of different roles, uh, the Classic Sports Network, there were a number of acquisitions and moving around. You got into the VC space, I think, after that, right? right. Um, in, a number of, uh, in a number of different areas, but that also led to your continued work with, it was college sports television, and then CBS, because through M&A. Um, and then when you came to what is now iHeart, that was Clear Channel at that point. I uh, yeah, and uh, there, uh, Kamal was senior VP for administration. And now, if you can keep track of all this, because I, I don't know how he does, he is the senior vice president of human resources operations and facilities management for iHeartMedia, which means pretty much like everything. So, uh, Kamal, thank you also for spending time with us. I know you have a lot of uh, clearly a lot of things going on, and yet you're making time for uh, all the Husky alums. We appreciate it. So first thing, I know the video gives you sort of this great uh, injection of, of energy when you see a motivational pump video like that. iHeartMedia is really an amazing place. I've just been doing a lot of my prep and trying to study this place as much as I possibly can. Not that I'm an expert, but the media world has changed so much. Music has changed so much. Content delivery in whatever form has changed so much in broadcasting. And iHeart's really been living at the bleeding edge of that. Uh, for really all of its all of its time, and while a lot has changed, certain things surprisingly have not. Terrestrial radio has proven incredibly resilient, and while that's still a portion of iHeart's holdings and its delivery, all of the new technologies that are available to us that most people decried as being the kinds of things that would undermine companies like iHeart. Uh, smart speakers and streaming and the way in which smartphones and mobile devices have changed have just added to the delivery vehicles for iHeart. And if, while we'll be talking a little bit more about all of the different people and functions that are at a company like this, but whether it's the voice you listen to on whatever talk radio or podcast during your commute time, whether it's the music that brings back certain memories for you or injects energy into something new, the soundtracks, the scores of our lives are enabled by people like this and other folks who work at a company like this. So this is a pretty special opportunity to not only do some good listening, but hopefully some good questioning as well. Um, iHeart's uh, 
reach, as you saw from the, the video, is not just 90% of America, but uh, I think it's, what, 275 million unique listeners in any given month, which is just a tremendous, a tremendous number of people, if you imagine that much volume in a technical sense, but also all of the different sub-markets that they have to reach. Um, overall, the, there were some stats that I was just watching earlier that you guys have scrolling in the far corner here, and I saw that even with the smart speaker market that's just grown in the last year, a lot of the uh, ratings information show that some 70 or 75% of adults of a smart speaker are uh, streaming terrestrial radio stations that they know and love and the personalities they love through those smart speakers. So really, there's a lot more content out there, people getting more of what they want. So it's just a lot to try and manage and get your arms around. And about a quarter of the stations that iHeart uh, owns and manages aren't music at all. It's other content and talk content that runs the gamut, and I'm sure if you guys are interested in all of that or if you need to get more information, we'll be able to talk about that. So um, at this point, just sort of turning it over, a lot has gone on just in recent months at iHeart. It's been <laughs> beyond the changes in the industry. Uh, when, you're, when you're the CFO, you touch a little bit of everything. And right now, while we're gonna talk about careers, if you were to just look at current news on iHeart, you see bankruptcy information everywhere, and that might make you go, oh man, like, you know, bad, because we associate that with the demise of companies like Sears in recent months, Toys R Us, but a lot of this was really about the structuring, the, all, all the work the bankers did probably over a decade ago um, to create what is now iHeart Media, and now, as that process is concluding, that freeing up all sorts of capital for a company that's managed to be successful in spite of debt service financing, a lot of great things going on. So John, why don't you bring us through some of that and take us into the present? We'll always start with the easy questions first. Um, I, I think, <laughs> but I, I think that, um, you know, there, there's, it's always, it's a tale of two cities. One being that the, the company had a very challenging capital structure, um, you know, a leverage buyout in 2008, tough economic conditions when the markets rebounded. You know, Facebook and Google gobbled up a lot of the money and a lot of the money didn't tr return to traditional media the way it needed to. Um, that being said, with all of the changes that we've, we've made to the company through iHeartRadio, through our events businesses, through just our you know, terrestrial radio business and all of the great things that we do uh, for our listeners and, and people that enjoy our content, the operating business of the company is is great. Um, you, you know, we're a public company. You can see the financials, and you know the company generates an awful lot of free cash flow. And the you know bankruptcy last March was really, you know, we we negotiated and went in with a deal with our lenders um, in order to you know exchange some of the equity from the company and and forgive some of the debt. That process is getting very close to being finished, and we're going to come out as a very very healthy company where we'll have a capital structure that is as healthy as the operating business is. And so we, you know, for, for people like myself, you know, the bankruptcy has been a, it's been a rough year. <laughs> but I think for everybody else, there was a little scary period during the first half of the year when you're getting into it because people aren't sure. You know, but you can see we didn't lay anybody off. We didn't do anything drastic. And we really, you know, the message to everybody is we're gonna, we're gonna double down. We're gonna continue doing what we're great at. And we're going to come through this, and, and you can see, you know, by all the things that we're doing, the festivals, et cetera, we haven't skipped a beat, and we're continuing to add new things. You know, we, we bought How Stuff Works uh, a few months back, and which is one of the greatest, uh, you know, podcasting content companies there is. We're now the, the, the nation's uh, number one commercial podcaster. Um, we just uh, closed an acquisition around a company called Jelly, which uh, has been the backbone of our programmatic buying platform. And so we are continuing to build for the future, even while, you know, you know, from the kind of the press standpoint or the financial news standpoint, people say, well, they're challenged. Is this really, is this really a good thing or is this a problem with the business? The business is really, really healthy. And I think we're doing a lot of great things and setting ourselves up, not just for tomorrow, but for the next 10 years and beyond. And um, it's, it's been a really exciting, you know, time to be here. I mean, I've been here nearly five years and I knew when I walked in the door that we were going to file bankruptcy at some point in time, and I still came. And it was really about trying to do the things that I could do to help, you know, put the company in the best position. So for whatever structure the company took place or whatever happened, that we'd come out of it at the back end uh, stronger, 
leaner, better, faster, and all the things that we're doing. And that's that's really been the been the goal and what we've been working so hard at internally. So I think for most people in the company, I think Kamal would agree that you know in the last few months nobody else is really paying attention to you know the bankruptcy process. I mean, there's a handful of us that are still in the thick of it and have to manage it on a day to day basis. But overall, it's been uh, it's been a good thing. I think the most excited I was was the day we actually filed because then we could actually start the process of getting on with our lives. And uh, you know, we're like I said, we're just about coming out of it. Confirmation hearings are in a couple of weeks, and you know, we're really excited to uh, to put that behind us and, and and move forward to the next chapter. One of the reasons I did want to start there, even though that's such seems like such an ugly question, is you know we have a negative association with that word, but this isn't really just spin. I mean, just all the analysts really agree this is sort of like a a, a one-off. The the fundamentals of the company are really quite solid, and. Well, it's been a painful process. I think this is probably the perfect time to be talking about a company like iHeart because now it's it's going to be unencumbered by a lot of the structural things that probably got in its in, a, in its way. So you see what they've been able to do already. Just imagine what's coming. But uh, one of the other reasons I started there, and uh, you and I were talking about this a little bit in prep time before, is a lot of the time when folks look at any financial function or any corporate function, whether it's HR or finance uh, or legal or IT, we, we tend to think of it as a place we have to get something past or get something through. But from the financial lens, strategically, you get to see a lot about almost any company. And I don't know that people always appreciate that fully. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, because your lens on not just iHeart, but even on the sector is going to be very different than, than a lot of folks. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, sometimes you look at you look at titles, you look at, you know, CFO, and you say, well, what does that mean? And and even if you look at Kamal's title, which you know I sometimes refer to as Kamaling, because Kamal does a lot of various things that, you know, you know, if you need a helicopter in 20 minutes, Kamal will get it for you. <laughs> Those sorts of things, right? Um, but I think you know when you get to be senior management in a company of this size, um, you're not, you know, the you know there's there's a variety of components, right? I mean, I have a, an accounting component to my job, and I'm a, I was an accounting major at UConn uh, 93. I went to Price Waterhouse first came up through that side of the business. Um, but there's also a financial aspect and there's an operations and technology component as well. And you know, when I look at like, how do I spend my time, it's really a mix of like, what are the things from a both accounting, finance, operations, technology standpoint that I can do to help the company run better and really you know, support the business. I mean, I think everybody needs to understand the main function of what the company's business is. And I think sometimes people get too wound up in their job or their title or their specific item. And when, when you look at what we do here at iHeart, we do two things. We create content and, and generate these relationships between the content we create and our listeners and people that consume our content. And then we monetize that content. And everything that we do here has to really support one of those two items. You know, it's not about... You know, my job in and of itself isn't important for the things that it does. It's it's important in the ways that it enables the things that are important to the business. When you see the crowds and you know it, it's you know and all the things we show in the sizzle reel, I you know I came here you know doing some financial engineering and some other things and really was going to try to help do some transformational work, and then I went to my first jingle ball. And you know, standing next to the stage in Chicago, and Nick Jonas comes on, and there's like 10,000 teenage girls like screaming, and I thought like, you know, I was gonna die, you know. It was like, it was like, it was like scary, but it also like, like we're doing something here, we're touching people's lives, and it's really, really important, and people care, you know. And I know nobody listens to the radio, right? Except there's 10,000 people at Jingle Ball, so obviously somebody listens, um, you know. But it, it, I think when you really, when you really look at it. You, you have to understand, you know, whatever company you're in and whatever function you're in, you have to understand how it relates to the mission of, of what's happening. And I think from, from that perspective, being in these roles that we have where, you know, I mean, whatever our titles are, we're all, all doing 100 different things with 100 different people on a day-to-day -day basis. No day is like yesterday. Tomorrow will be different. And, um, and, and it's really about having an open mind, looking at the big picture and really just being you know, um, available to use all of your skills and tool set to, to help, you know, make the company succeed and, and help everybody achieve their goals. Kamal, I'm curious. Uh, I think whenever we look at any brand or any company that we have a relationship with uh, or just even know of through the news, we get a particular image of what that's like. But the 
real employer brand or the culture of the organization is usually kind of hard to get a sense of. And I think John touched on it a little bit. There's, there's a lot of important and magical stuff going on here. And I imagine that, that all of that informs what the culture of the organization is like. So talk a little bit about what kind of exists organically already and then some of the work that you're doing in, in kind of advancing that forward to the next, its next evolution. Yeah, I think um, when you think about culture and what it is for iHeart, I think it's a lot of it's, it's obviously the people, right? And what is it that drives the people to come in every day and work hard and get behind the products that we have? And there's a real sense of belonging and community and community service that we have across our company. And when you start thinking about times of need, when there's storms or hurricanes or disasters, our folks, when everyone's trying to get out of those areas, we put people into those areas to make sure that there's communications out to the communities. When we provide entertainment and news and weather to everyone on a daily basis, people wake up in the morning, the alarm clock's going off, you've got your news and weather happening in the morning, so how are you getting to work, how are you dressing that day? It's information, it's not just the music and all. And there's a real sense of pride across the company in providing that and being that voice for the communities that we serve. I think there's also a connection that people have, and we talk about all the time, you listen to the radio in the morning, and if you're here in New York and you listen to Z100 and you have Elvis Duran in the show, the, those are the people are the, the empty seat next to you. They're sitting in that empty seat in the car next to you. They're talking to you. They're like a friend. There's a companionship that's built, and there's a great deal of pride within that. And to be able to take those relationships and build them out, not only locally, but John mentioned, you know, he was at Chicago Jingle Ball, nationally in the events that we do, just take those things and expand those. And we talk about technology and how it's changing the landscape, and what it does is really allows those local stations, those local communities, to then expand that reach, right? I can be traveling on business or whatever. I can stay connected with my home community. Um, I could be a UConn alum and listen to UConn radio anywhere I am, right? I'm not, so sorry about that. 97.9 Hartford so <laughs> on the iHeartRadio app. <laughs> and so technology really allows us to expand that as well. But there's a sense of community that our employees have uh, across the board, uh, you know, we have 15,000 people who really care about being that voice and making sure we deliver that signal every morning or every day and, and stay connected with the communities. And that, and that, just to add on that, that sounds like, it sounds like a great thing to say, but until you've actually heard it when, you know, in Panama City this year with, with you know, the hurricane and, you know, we had, a, we had an antenna down and it was very, very dangerous and most people left and we had people sleeping in the station we were up 24 hours a day, seven days a week during that whole process. A couple of the other broadcasters basically were wiped out, and you know we're the lifeline to that community. And, and you know you got to think about people are risking their own health and families and lives and not protecting their assets or their homes because they understand how important they are to the community. And the same thing with the wildfires out in California. You know when you you know and that's one of the great things about technology. You used to never be able to listen to that. You can always pick up and listen. So if there's a piece of news in Houston with the floods before and everything else, mm -hmm. you can go find a station, listen to what's going on, and really understand what's happening on the ground. And that that is something where, like, I don't think, you know, sometimes you don't think about that. But when you hear it, it's really, really, really powerful. And it shows from all the local um, charity things that we do and everything else, there's a huge connection between the people in our local radio stations and the communities they're in. And that really makes you know you know us really want to make sure that we're working hard to support them so they can do the best job because it is a product that that actually people care about and it matters in their lives. The it's hard for us to keep up. You could see the awkwardness as we all tried to handle the biography and background, but everybody's got a story, uh, all of you included, and myself, and certainly while uh, these guys do, a lot. So many folks come to me specifically to say, hey, how do I get from here to there professionally, or I'm looking to make a change? And uh, Kamal, just your title, okay? Senior Vice President for Human Resources, Operations, and Facilities Management. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that I found out in conversation earlier kind of is embedded under those things from security to, you know, probably 14 others that I'm just not aware of. So while this is supposed to be about iHeart, media, I think personal stories are important. To the extent you can kind of distill that, how on earth does somebody find themselves in a senior role that spans all of those things at a company like this? Because that sounds like a lot of, a lot of fun to be having in a position, but it's not one that most of us would, would imagine. How, how did you end up here? That's a great question. 
I'm not sure I have a great answer, but it is. It's a lot of fun. And I get to work with people like John and, and across the company. Like I said, 15,000 people who care about what they do on a daily basis, and that's really what makes it fun. Um, my role evolved over time. I came into the company almost eight years ago now through an acquisition. So I was at a small startup, 65 employees based in Soho. Uh, we had a mobile app, and we were a mobile music streaming app. And when um, Bob Pittman, who's the CEO of our company, had just come in shortly before that, and they were trying to figure out how to be competitive in the digital space. So we have this amazing uh, set of assets on the broadcast radio side of the business, and how are we going to compete with you know, the, the digital side and everything that was, that was coming down the road? And he said, well, we can build our own digital platform, or we can go buy one. And I was at a startup. It was called Thumbplay, and we were acquired. Uh, 65 of us came in, and I was on the administrative, I'm an accountant, I have an accounting degree uh, back in the day. Before that, uh, I was a mechanical engineering and physics major at one point in time. Um, changed, uh, have an account, a business degree. And I've been at a number of startups, and when you're at a small company, you do a little bit of everything, right? So I was the accountant, I was the HR person, I ran payroll um, at a very small scale came into this company, and we knew that they bought the technology. So the software engineers and the, you know, the other folks had jobs. We knew that were they were going to do. And there was a point in time where they asked me you know, what I did and with the lens of, do we really need this other person here? And I opened my mouth, and I started asking questions. And I started asking questions like, who's in charge of security here? And who is, does manage the company planes and whatnot? And it turned out there was no one assigned to those things. And because I had opened my mouth, they ended up getting assigned to me. Uh, I do have some background doing real estate. I've done a number of uh, office build outs and things. Uh, so when it was time to build these offices that we're sitting in today, uh, I was called. I was in Tribeca at our offices where our radio stations are located. And they said, we need a project manager to run the construction project of building our new corporate headquarters. And they said, well, this guy Kamal said he knew something about building office space. So let's make him put him in charge of it. Uh, when I came into the company, the name of the company was Clear Channel at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step back a little bit, a little information about Clear Channel and why that was the company name. And this goes back into the pride and the sense of ownership people have in this company. There are radio frequencies. There's a number of AM radio frequencies that are called the Clear Channels. Those cha frequencies allow, if there was ever a national disaster, if there was any where, a reason to communicate to the entire country across the continent, those channels get lit up. We manage those frequencies. We have a um, right, you know, not just a right, but an obligation to ensure that those stay on air, even through a national disaster, through hurricanes, storms, and anything else. And there's a huge sense of pride in that. So that, that's what Clear Channel was. But at some point, that had dropped away, and um, you know, everyone started thinking it was a cable company or whatever it was. The name wasn't uh, meaningful to the consumers, and iHeart had become a thing. iHeart Radio was the digital platform. And people started referring to us as iHeart, and we decided to change the name to iHeart Media. And at one point in time, they said, well, who's going to change the name of the company? And they said, well, Kamala, you should be the project manager for changing the name of the company. And we're going to do it in six weeks. So I picked up that responsibility at some point as well. But more than anything, it is when an opportunity is put in front of you, taking it, right? Taking the opportunity to step up and say, you know what, I might be able to do that. I don't shy away from opportunity to, to be involved in anything. So that's how it happened. One of the things that you said was, well, I started asking questions. And uh, so much, even just this afternoon, I was working with somebody who was doing some interview prep for what she's hoping will be her first executive position, moving from like senior mid-management to her first uh, vice presidency. And yeah, we spent a little bit of time talking about responses to some questions that she might anticipate or may not have anticipated. But I spent far more time on what questions the candidate asks both in the selection process as well as when I'm working with folks who are very happy where they are, but they're just trying to set themselves up for success. Most of us feel like we have to have the right answers, and asking the right questions is a big part of finding your way, and I think that's what led, in a lot of ways, to where, where you find yourself. But a question, I guess, initially come out to you, but John starts sort of thinking about your response also, because you're looking at talent from two different lenses, I guess, in the, in the company. In thinking about that portal to the company, somebody is interviewing at a company like iHeart, even just trying to get on the radar of folks here, what are the kinds of things that um, folks should think about? This is a pretty unique place, so I imagine it's uh, recruitment, 
hiring selection process probably has some uniqueness to it as well. It definitely does, right? There's a, every company has it where there's a cultural fit and we wanna make sure we have a proper cultural fit as well. This company is culture, right? Music and everything we do is culture. The events that we do all is based in culture. So that's really key. Someone's gonna fit in with the rest of the team. And John and I are both wearing jackets, but I think we both keep them in the office just for events like this. We, the jeans and shirt are pretty much the way it goes. So it's a different culture and it does, it's not always the right fit for people. Um, I think look, anywhere you're hiring, if you're a manager and you're hiring, if you get you know, 30% of the time, 50% of the time, the right people, you're a genius, right? So you, it takes time, it takes, you have to learn that, right? It's, hiring is a, a learned thing. You have to go through the process a number of times. Um, and I think, we, you know, we wanna find people who are open to opportunity. I, I, that's what I look for, people who are open to opportunities. You know, I, I look at it where, you know, we, we do a lot of hiring, um, you know, through my finance organization throughout the company. I mean, we have, 158 markets, I have finance people sitting in most of those markets, as well as our shared services groups down in San Antonio, my team's up here. And, and you know, what, what I typically try to look for are smart, engaged people that just want to learn. Um, you know, you think about like, how did I end up going from public accounting to banking to the music business to an online dating startup to here? You know, it, like I didn't know anything about the radio business. I didn't know anything about the advertising business. And, and I think for the first six months here, I, I felt like I was a toddler. But ultimately, you know, the intellectual curiosity, the work ethic, the drive, if you know and understand business, you can learn the specifics of the thing you want to do. Um, I think sometimes where people are like, I'm laser focused on I want to do this particular job. I think sometimes you get it wrong because as you can tell by the things that we do, like our job titles are nearly irrelevant to like what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. We're both the kind of people that, you know, Bob and Rich and the rest of the senior executive team, anything that goes on, John, Kamal, Steve, there's a handful of us, go fix it, right? No matter what it is. And so um, I think, you know, really trying to find people that are going to, from a cultural perspective, it's, it's less about the specific, you know, thing about them. It's really about, do they want to be here? Do they want to help advance the company to the next stage? Are they going to challenge us? Are they gonna make it better? Are they really trying to help us build for the future? Or do they wanna check? Like, and, and so the reality is for me is that I want people that are gonna come in, be curious, challenge the status quo, and really try to help, build, help us build what we believe is, you know, we're obviously one of the biggest media companies out there, and I think we're, there's still a lot of things that we're probably not doing as well as we could, and so, you know, all the things that we can do, we need people to help, you know, help us be better at what we're doing. And where those ideas come and, and everything else, it's, it's certainly not, you know, with 10, 15,000 people here, nothing is incumbent on one person. It's, it's incumbent on the, the group. And so people that want to be part of that group and help drive the organization forward, that's the way I, that's the way I kind of look at it. So it's a lot of it, some of, it, some of it's a style perspective or you know, I, I probably, when I interview people, I don't, spend, I spend very little time talking about their actual specific skills, their, their point of view, their frame of reference, their goals are, are a lot more important because if they're smart enough and, and, and they want to do the right things and they're, 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 they have the right frame of mind, you can teach them the actual things that they need to do. Which gets back to fit, right? I mean, you know, each, as you were both talking about, whether it's responding in times of national emergency or even just, you know, being prepared for certain types of crises, it was subtle, but in the micro expressions, because I'm so close, sitting so close to you, I could see that little bit of emotion come over, and for most of us, you can't fake that. So I imagine all of those sort of intangibles that come across become really important when you're trying to staff up something that's moving this quickly. Um, whether it's a tech, whether we think of this as a tech company or we think of it as a media enterprise or an advertising entity or whatever, um, most of us, tend to think about the functions that we would most obviously imagine or interact with, but whether it's a corporate function or some of the less visible uh, things going on, what are the areas of the company that maybe we wouldn't think about that, are, that you're experiencing or at least expecting to need a pipeline for? Who are the types of people that we ought to be thinking about as a community that we should say, oh, you know, this is somebody who should talk to the folks over at iHeart, whether it's either one of you or 
somebody else? Like, where's the, where does the talent pipeline need to be? Well, I think from a hiring perspective, we hire approximately 3,000 people a year, right? We, and that's a good number. Uh, right now, we're making a significant investment in technology. So we have a lot of software engineers and other uh, technology positions. Uh, some of them are based here in New York. Some of them are based down in Austin, Texas, or San Antonio, other places, other parts of the country. Um, one of the things we mentioned, John mentioned it, we, are, we have 158 different cities we're in, right? So we've got uh, a huge footprint. Um, we do, obviously, we're at the core, we're in advertising. We have a sales team. So there's always sales hires happening. That's a good portion of our hiring on an annual basis. Um, what else do you think, John? I mean, I think, you know, there's, you know, at the end of the day, right, there's like, and this is one of the things that even sometimes being a corporate, you don't have a feel for. And, and, and because I'm CFO for the markets group and, and, and that encompasses all the radio stations, you know, there are actual radio stations out there. When you go in, you know, go to Hartford to sit in the stations or San Antonio or, or wherever in the country, even to some of the little ones like Brunswick, Georgia, you know, or, or wherever I happen to be in the country for whatever reason, I always tend to try to stop by and, and, and say hello to whoever's there. And, and, you know, small markets and big markets are different. You know, what, what we need in New York at the, at the radio stations downtown is very different than what I might need in, in Biloxi, Mississippi. But it's, it's really about, um, you know, the, there's, it's sales, marketing, are obviously key. You know, we have about 1,600 sellers in the local markets. We have probably three or 400 more sellers at, at the corporate or national level, both on the total traffic and weather network, the premier networks, our national sales teams, multi-markets, um, our event sellers. Um, and <clears throat> so that's, you know, a good, you know, 2,000 people pro or, or, or more than that overall. Um, support for those teams, support for the marketing, um, we have our events team, our national programming group, and our events team actually help us run these events. Um, and, and everything from even, you know, Chris, Chris, and Allie here that, that really help events like this go smoothly because, you know, for, you know, if I'm sitting in there and there's an event out here, it's like, well, it's magic. It just happens. Well, it's not magic. It's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, but, but the reality of it is, is there are people like there's, there's, there's kind of a niche that, you know, when you say, is this a technology company, a marketing company, an advertising company? Well, it's all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, 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 you know, you could, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, when I was at Goldman Sachs years ago, it's like, well, you know, we hire bankers and we hire accountants and finance people and that's kind of it. And, and I think you're a technologist and, and, and everybody kind of stays in their lane and does their thing. I think here, I think everybody does a little bit of everything and wears a lot of different hats. And so it's really a question of people that want to get involved in the things that we do and have the, the right skills and effort, you know, I mean, some of our, some of our best sellers are people that, you know, have technology degrees or they were business people or whatever else. And, and I think that, you know, there are a lot of people here um, and even, even our chairman, Bob Pittman, didn't go to college, right? So, you know, so, you know, and, and, and he's CEO, he's a CEO. And, yeah. and so, and so I think, you know, everybody has had a different path to, to, to be here. And I think, it, you know, what I've always said about companies is, you know, I've worked at Price Waterhouse, I've worked at Goldman Sachs, I've worked at Warner Music Group, I've worked here, and then I've worked at a couple of places that I didn't like so much. But and, and what I've learned by that is is that if you're going to try to work somewhere and you care about what you do, you want to be in the leader of the industry that you're in. Don't go work at the fifth or sixth company in, in that industry. If you really care about it, try to find the first or second company at the top of their game and try to get in there. And I would worry a little bit less about the thing that you're gonna do in that company day one because if you really like what you're doing, you want to be there, you'll find your way, right? I mean, it's like the, what I'm doing today versus what I was doing, even though my title's been pretty much the same the whole time, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis today versus what I did five years ago, it's absolutely night and day. And I think you'll, you'll evolve inside an organization the way you want to, but it's really a question of like the type of organization you want to be in, the people you want to be around, and the type of work that you want to do and then from there, I, I think that, you know, sometimes people get pigeonholed too much about, like, I'm going to go sit in my cube and do my thing. And I think, like, people sometimes limit themselves. And I would say that you really want to have an open mind to it and say that if you want to be in a particular company, then you might even want to go in the side door because at the end of the day, you'll get to where you need to go anyway. I, I always found that people, in my opinion, the people that really want something are going to go find it no matter how um, they do it. And, and, and you just have to be... You know, ingenious and sometimes push a little bit harder to, to get what you want. 
I'm going to be turning this to the audience in a sec, so you folks, if you haven't already, start thinking about your questions. But before I do, since this is a Yukon audience, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the most eloquent way to ask it, but in one thing I have noticed, even though I didn't attend Yukon, is that this is a community of helpers. And while there are a lot of places where people talk, it's nice to have people who do, Dennis, yourself, um, and, and others. But uh, John, specifically, what is it about either your UConn experience, whether it was as a student, as an alum, both, uh, that is still so special and important that still enables specifically your work and your own career trajectory? Because you're still only about halfway through, man. You got a lot more to do. So um, what is it that these folks should be thinking about leveraging since they're part of that community? One thing I would say, and, and you know, some of you may feel like this and some may not. Um, I know UConn's come a long way since I was there. Um, but when I went to Goldman from after a couple years at Price Waterhouse, you know, I got hired by a UConn grad, which, which was fantastic, which was a nice way in. And, and she was like, wow, that's really interesting. We don't see a lot of UConn grads down here. And then even when we went, started going to campus visits, I, when I was at Goldman, started going back and recruiting people into Goldman from UConn, and I was like, nobody had ever done that before. And there was always this thought process that, eh, you know, UConn's a nice school, but like we'll get all our people from, you know, Michigan and the, and the Ivies and whatever, and, and, and we don't need to kind of, we don't need to go to UConn. So I think for me, I've always felt a little bit like there's a little something to prove Right, because although you know, I, I mean, it's a it's a it's a great public university. We're also New York City here. We're smack dab in the middle of every great school. You know, all the people in in the city and and around here, up and down the East Coast. There's a million great schools, and and the competition's really really fierce. And I think sometimes, you know, even when I was younger in my career, like I wasn't sure whether I was good enough or I was as good. And one of the reasons I took the job at Goldman was wow, I got a job offer to work on Wall Street. Like, I'm like, I grew up in Wisconsin. This is like unbelievable. This is, I was like, honestly, it was like a dream. Like, is this really going to happen? And, and I went there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get there and everybody's going to be 10 times smarter than I am and I'm just never going to cut it. And I'm like, I got there and I'm like, okay, it's pretty much the same, right? And by the way, there are plenty of people at Goldman that are a lot smarter than I am, but like I fit in just fine. And, and I think that, you know, that experience and some of the other things I've done across my career you know, the conf you should have the confidence, uh, and, and I'll tell you, UConn of today is, is better than UConn of 20 years ago when I went there, or 25 years ago, I guess, <laughs> at this stage. But um, when you really, when you think about it, I think, you know, there's, there's, you know, having that little bit of edge, there's something to prove. But everybody here who's, who's, who's gone through that experience and has that, you should feel that you have the ability to do anything you want to do. And the only thing that's really going to limit you is, is kind of yourself. And I would say to try to make sure that you, um, you know, use the network. I mean, I'm fond of saying, and, and it happens, and some, not, I would say not enough people take up on, on me, but they probably should. I will take a meeting with anybody from UConn for any reason. You know, whether it's career advice, whether it's a big crowd, man. Think no, twice listen, about that I, I said the same thing at Stanford, Stanford campus graduation 18 months ago, and I got, you know, an email from a student, you know, like over, the, over Christmas break, and I have a call Friday morning with, with, with somebody who wants an internship. And, and listen, it, you know, it may not always work, but I've connected people to other people. We've hired people. I've done lots of other things. I've given people advice. And, and ultimately, for me, you know, and, and part of it is maybe it is because of that underdog feel in New York City and because I bleed blue for whatever reason. Um, I, I believe it's my job as kind of a, you know, senior elder statesman or so of sorts to really help the next generation of people um, you do that, I, I, and, and you know, I went to Columbia for my MBA for, for the, through the exec program, and I saw, I didn't really understand how bad the UConn Alumni Network was until I went to Columbia and graduated in 2005, and how strong that network was, and I was like, we've got it wrong, and I said, I gotta be part of the solution to help make it right. You know, we joined the alumni chapter, you know, Lindsay and Nick and some of the other people here, you know, we, we, we fought the good fight over those years and, and really helped try to build something in New York City to try to bring people back together. The kind of dream of that is having events like this. And the fact that this is here and I can host it and I'm honored to, I'm honored to do that um, is, is a testament to a lot of hard work from people at the foundation and everybody through that kind of fought the fights over the year to kind of really bring the alumni together the way they need to be so we can really be the family that we, that we are, we should be. And I think people have to leverage that network because 
the people from Columbia, NYU, Princeton, Penn, all that, they're leveraging their networks, right? And so we all have to do the same thing. And so, you know, even though, you know, as, as people sometimes, you know, you're not always going to get along with everybody, but you also have to kind of take that step back and say, you're UConn first, and, and we really need to help each other. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a huge message that I want to get across tonight. And embedded in that from both of you is while, whether it's leading on technology or coming to an event, uh, this stuff isn't transactional. You know, this is a real human endeavor. And whether it's hiring or referring people or just getting sound guidance. So um, those things happen over time as opposed to quickly. But uh, let me turn it to, we have kind of a big audience here and I hope, I, can, I think I can see people in the back row. Here. Love everybody. My name is uh, Justice Lopez. Really appreciate you all taking the time out to be here. Uh, I'm a young entrepreneur. I started uh, a company called Just Experience, and I just uh, I graduated from UConn in 2014 and 15. Uh, I was the Husky mascot, so really involved, so bleed blue. Uh, whoop, whoop. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would love to hear from your expertise and wisdom. Uh, top five things a young entrepreneur should considering when entering into the new entrepreneurial realm. Um, either from your personal experience or things that you've seen um, other entrepreneurs do well? Yeah, so um, I came into this company for, through a startup. I had been in a number of other st startups that, uh, you know, different transactions happen, different M&A transactions. I think uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you do the proper research, right? Everything's so analytics and database. Do the research of whatever your product or service is Where's your audience? And make sure you target that properly. And make sure you have the right focus, right? I think from what I do on a, as an HR person, hiring the right people, people who care, people who are behind whatever service that you're doing, that's very important. Um, and that want to be there, right? John said that before. It's really key that you find people that want to be part of what you're doing and believe in it, right? So I think that's really important for you. Um, and then, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're going out, you're asking for financing or, or whatnot. Find investors or people that are going to back you who also believe, honestly believe in what you're doing and will support you there. Um, those are the kind of the three big things I would say. I, I would agree. I mean, I think it's really about um, understanding where you're at, understanding what you want out of it, right? Some people build a company, they want to sell it. Some people build a company because they're really passionate in it. And you have to understand, are you there to make money? Or are you there because you want to do something? And there's, like, there's some companies that have been really great you know, and influential that didn't never made a lot of money. And then there's other companies that blew up and became really big. And even when they have, sometimes they lost their mission because in order to get that big, it became about the money or about something, you know, so really just making sure you're true to your, your mission. And, and again, surrounding yourself with the right people and, and, and just having a plan and making sure that you've, like I said, uh, you, that you've done your homework and understand where you, where you are and make sure that you're also doing something if you want to be unique that 20 other people aren't doing because you know you, you may have an idea but somebody else may have it in a garage you know halfway across the country and so you know but I think it's really about having passion for what you do because if anything you do if you have passion it's going to come through um, and so I think that's that's the number one thing but you also have to surround yourself with other people that have that same passion because as, as one person it's it's it, you know you're not, you're not going to get as far as you can as you can with a team. Sir, I believe you've got the mic. Ready? Alex Christopher, uh, graduated, actually close to justice. I remember him from school, uh, 2015. Um, but John, question for you. You touched uh, briefly on your MBA experience. You said, was it an executive MBA or you went full-time Columbia? Uh, it was the exec program. So it was a Friday, Saturday program, um, you know, 20 months. So roughly the same time as it would do doing it full-time, but I did it while I was at West LB. So I was, yeah, I had two babies and was doing that and going to school and going to Germany all the time. And, and uh, so it was, it was the 20 best and worst months of my life, I think. But, but I think, you know, it was, um, you know, and I, and, I tell, and I tell people that, you know, the Columbia, the, the people I met at Columbia and the, and, and, the, and the MBA program was great, but it's also really about the people that you meet there. Um, you know, the, the MBA experience is not largely about, like, necessarily the quality of the instructors. It's, what you get because you're usually experienced and you're sitting in, you know, I had 65 or 130 people in, in our cohorts and all of them had a various degree of work experience. So you really learn from each other. Um, and I'm a big proponent of grad school work no matter where it is. Um, but I think you kind of need a, a good enough base of work experience to do it. Otherwise, you're probably not going to get out of it what, what you would want. And so it's, it's kind of, you know, not you, you don't need it for every um, 
every sort of career, but like depending on where you are in your career, um, it's certainly something that you should talk to other people that have done it because I think you know it's it's uh, was hugely beneficial for me. And I will say that I, I probably, from the kind of content of the 20 months I was there, I learned a few things, but I, it wasn't really about what I learned on the educational side. It was the relationships and some of the other things that happened during the program. And now I have a network on top of my, my UConn network, my Columbia network. I can, any problem that I have, it, I can call anybody and somebody has an answer or somebody knows somebody, I can get to an answer really quick. And, 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 one of the, and, and that helps with one of my biggest things is that no matter where you are in your career, one of the most important things is that you need to know what you know and you need to know what you don't know. And don't try to be a hero. If you don't know how to do something, find somebody that does and utilize them and leverage them. Um, trying to bluff your way through something that you don't understand is career suicide. Um, and by the way, even if you get it right, you don't win. Like, you just get lucky. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that I've, I've done and accomplished here, but I, I've, I've absolutely leveraged my network, and my network, network leverages me as well. Um, and I think that's one of the important, important things to take away. There's a question over here. Hi. Uh, Danielle, proud UConn honors grad. I think I'm probably more in this generation than the Thank rest, you. but I'm here tonight with here two wonderful women who I met at the last UConn alumni event. So first, I want to just pay gratitude to everybody who's empowering that because I agree with what you said. Like, I never knew when I just went off to New York, like, I'm smart, I'm going to get a job. Like, I never had any clue that a network would be helpful, right? I'm a senior HR professional, stumbled into it, but have been doing it for a long time, American Express, I helped to grow LinkedIn's New York office, but I had no idea that just by luck I got my job at American Express after it was open for a year because somebody in a networking group passed my resume because my, the filters would have weeded me out because I didn't go to Harvard or anything else. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. And thank you to everybody who's really cultivating the UConn alumni network and these lovely ladies who I met at the last event and we reached out to each other to come. And also, I, f I feel you, man, doing operations and facilities and HR and <laughs> engagement and talent and everything. I just wanted to say, <laughs> I totally understand, but I just wanted to also say thank you to the UConn alumni network. No question. Thank you. The underlying message is while there's a lot that you may want to focus on to get any resume to stand out, this is, like I said, it's a human endeavor. And there's nothing that matches reaching out to another human being. They don't necessarily have to sit at the apex of the organization like these guys do. But um, I can't tell you how many times I've reached out to total strangers. And while they don't all respond, uh, in some cases, those that have have been incredibly helpful, have been incredible advocates, sometimes over time incredible friends. Uh, and in certain cases, they have been, you know, sitting in the C-suite of companies. Those folks respond every now and again. So you don't know until you, you, you take your shot. Um, Josh, any other announcements, housekeeping, and wrap-up besides uh, thanking our guests? a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> I, know, I know we're short on time. Uh, the bar is still open for a few more minutes. So if you want, go down there, grab another drink before we head out. We're in the space till about 9 o'clock. Then I was told the AC turns off, so uh, take that for what it is. <laughs> it's one way to get everybody moving, right? So uh, big round of applause again, if I can, for all everybody taking part here at iHeartMedia. John, as our alum and our primary host tonight, can't thank you enough. Kamal, thank you for joining us. John, as an honorary Husky, for helping us out across the country. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark, if I can ask you to grab those bags right over there for me. we got a special thank you for our uh, panelists tonight. Um, for all of our New York City alumni volunteers, thank you so much for joining us, for hosting us, and for helping us all the time. For all of you that are joining us uh, again today, thank you. This is uh, one of a number of events we're hosting across the country. John's actually on his way to DC to do another one of these panels tomorrow. Uh, and then we are in Chicago next week. We are in New Haven. We are in uh, uh, San Francisco, LA, San Diego, Denver. Uh, you name it, we're across the country. And then John's doing a wrap up at the end of the month on a online webinar. Uh, so if you want to hear a little bit more, it's about career setbacks. So I know many people have experienced those over time. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, please come join us again at another event. And if you've got suggestions, 
I mean, we did Google last year. We did iHeartMedia this year. What's next? We need your suggestions, so let us know about those. Thank you all for joining us. Come and talk to our panelists, talk to our volunteers, and thank you all.